Well, to speak after Arthur. I represent Islington North in London, and as a constituency, it couldn't be more different to this area here. If you look at it, there's more open space in this park than there is in the whole of my constituency of 65,000 people. But there are a lot of similarities. Our unemployment rate is 22%. For school leavers, the unemployment rate is about 60%. For black school leavers, it's about 80 or 90%. Our area, an inner city area, within sight of the City of London, suffers all the deprivation and all the poverty that the Thatcher government have heaped on the northeast of England. The similarities are very much there. And so that's why, during the miners' strike, when Arthur came to speak at our town hall, the town hall was full, the gallery was full, the street outside was full, and throughout the strike, all the support meetings for the miners' strike were overflowing. And that is why our support groups were able, the National Police Force, to try and break that strike. The media were mobilised in a way that they've only been mobilised in 1926 and the Second World War to try to vilify Arthur and the other leaders of the NUM and to destroy that union and to divide the Labour movement. And there's something ironic that this huge TV mast here overlooking this village does not carry to the viewers of the rest of this country the sense of community and value that the miners' strike brought to the mining communities and the whole of the industrial working class. That is a job for us in the future. But I think what you've also got to recognise, and I'm sure you do, that the systematic erosion of the authority of trade unions since 1979 has been as a deliberate act as policy as creating mass unemployment because they know that by creating mass unemployment harnessing and shackling trade unions finding trade union leaders and taking the funds away they've got carte blanche for the multinationals of the likes of Rupert Murdoch to come in and destroy industries and destroy jobs because that is what the trade union laws are all about and when they refused to give financial support to the mining industry, to defend the mining industry. It was because they preferred nuclear power and all the state power that goes with nuclear power, never mind the danger. It was because they wanted to smash the NUM, and they've shown their true colours now by being prepared to give £23 million to a multinational corporation that's hardly paid a penny in tax in the past few years, yet to destroy the mining industry. And they call it...
got into producing this past week and today in particular. The idea was born really about a year ago. We started in What is it done for the community? Well, the deals went off very well. I think there's, in the wake of the miners' strike, there's um, some people who are worried about what might happen to you. So it's went off very well. And I think really, I think the community of Bernie should be open. Who, uh, whose idea was it in the first place? Can you remember those 18 months ago? It was a couple of people actually. Um, <laughs> and I told us that we realised that Carla had taken place in 26th and it just happened that this year this is the 60th anniversary of the so it's an ideal time to At best, how often do you think it could be repeated? Um, well, it could be repeated every year if you have the, the man called, you know, with the whole intention of doing it. So it's so time for it to so, must be a bit
Scotland organised this event to dear to organise this event in 1926. And I also, all congratulations to them, fair enough, they, they could be dead, gone, you know. I can see I'm not the world's best speaker, but I'll talk to people. <laughs> Show there was no Durham Miners Gala in the year 1926. 
Yet there was a gala that year, some eight miles from the city of Durham, at the hilltop village of Bernhop. Bernhop found itself in the national limelight as thousands of miners converged on the village in the year of the general strike to keep faith with a cherished tradition. Last week, Bernhop celebrated the Diamond Jubilee of that gala, celebrations which came to a nostalgic head yesterday. A cemetery at Tanfield and Derwentside in the early hours of Saturday morning and a suitably nostalgic beginning to the final day of the celebrations. Miners' leaders unveiled a memorial to the man who became known as the Pitman's poet, Tommy Armstrong, and folk singer Tommy Gofellin was on hand to pay his own tribute. Now if you're inclined to hear a song, I'll sing a verse or two. And when I's done, you're gallant to say that if a reward is true, the miners of South Madam's Lane, they never will forget. For Isaac and his tyranny, and how they had been tret. For in the midst of danger, these hardy sons did toil, for to earn their daily bread so far beneath the soil, to make an honest livelihood, each miner did contrive. But ye shall hear how they were served in 1995. Except Those who are students of Armstrong's work now hope this kind of event will signal the birth of much wider recognition for their hero. Uh, he would write songs and sell them for coppers and to aid strikes and evictions and all such as that. And what kind of lifestyle did he have himself in those days that you know of? Well, he's supposed to have been a very heavy drinker, so he probably made a few coppers to buy himself a pint or two. <laughs> There's a story about him, uh, the Red Row Public Houses, which, which is not too far off here. He had a writing competition with a, uh, a man from Newcastle called Maguire, and the song that came out of that competition was The, the Row Between the Cages, which Bert Lloyd uh, described as an isolated ma masterpiece as far as mining songs go. When you analyse these songs, you begin to get a picture of what was going on in the county. And I think it's so important, this, it should be introduced into schools the same as other countries, in particular the United States, where they've got uh, folklore departments in virtually every university. And it would be the, to the benefit of the intellectual development of young people if they were to have the same in this country, because there's so much folklore, in particular in this county, because this was the most important coal field in the world at this time. To try to understand the dramatic change at the Bernhop of yesteryear which this gala was celebrating, consider part of a 19th century report from the Durham County Local History Society. It read, where formerly there was not a single hut of a shepherd, the lofty steam engines of a colliery now stand their columns of smoke into the sky. And in the vicinity, a town is called, as if by enchantment, into immediate existence. And there were those present yesterday who contributed greatly to such history. The only living member, for example, of the 1926 Gala Committee. They came from Chopwell, and, and they, they walked from Dunstan. And where was there? No cars, of course. There was one car, only one car. one car in the whole. And that car, AJ Cooper's in the front, and I was sitting right beside him. And poor Joe, he, his throat was going, you know. He had a sick, sick, uh, cancer in the throat. And he turned to me, and he said to me, Be careful with me, lad. Be careful with me. And he, he told me then that he about his throat. A.J. Cook was a name which commanded constant respect, but it was the enormity of the crowd on that day in the 20s which lived longest in the memory of even those who were merely children on that historic occasion. A boy of 11. What memories do you have of it? Trying the chief thing, it was a very fine day, and I tried to cross the main road. It took me about half an hour. Really? because of the procession. Thousands and thousands of people. From the polo field through the village. I spent my time usually on Saturday at the cricket field, the cricket matches, first team or second team. And getting across back to there. <laughs> I had to wait. <laughs> the celebrations and this impressive exhibition of life in days long gone by had been the result of an exhausting schedule on the part of many. A schedule which probably rules out an early repetition. 
I think the idea was born really about two years ago, you know, and then we started 18 months ago, um, putting things together, or trying to put things together to to have what's happened today. Um, it's been a, a matter of sort of two meetings a week, and people getting together in the village twice a week to, to organise it, you know. Um, so it, there's a lot of work went into it. It's not it's not a thing that could be repeated every year because we just haven't got the facilities or the, the manpower to, to do what we've done. You know, it's took us 18 months to get to this stage. I'm really, I'm glad I've lived through the day. I'm 92 and I'm glad I've li lived to see this day. Up at the miners of Sooth Menemsley, they're gonna to make some stew. They're gonna to boil fat postic and his dirty candy crew. The master should have nought but soup as long as they're alive. In memory of the dirty tricks in 1895. Then Commander Postiki give the word and they started with the work. And though they were done at five o'clock, the dust and stopped till dark. And when they had done all they could and finished for the day, the Bobby's guard at Postic and his dirty dogs away. Fizek was a tyrant and the owners were the same. For the turnout of the strike, the war they meant to blame. Neither them nor Postic need expect their liver thrive. For what they did to Dipton men in 1985. Ah, but the miners of Sooth Menemsley, they're gonna to make some stew. They're gonna to boil fat postic and his dirty candy crew. The master should have nought but soup as long as they're alive. In memory of the dirty tricks in 1985. And a great day for everyone who brought that piece of history back to life. No, me and one that made up one minds to gan and catch the train. To gan to the tune to buy some clays for all little Jimmy and Jane. But when we got to Rowland Gill, the morning train was gone. There wasn't a mare to gan that day till twenty minutes to one. So I see us one and it's a long way to gan. I see be off here, she was vexed. But I see us never mind, we've got plenty of time. We'll stop and gan in with the next. She gave a bit smell when I spoke up and said there's a public who's along here. We'll gun along and have ourselves well in the glass of the best bit of beer. No nan was see fat and she couldn't whack and she didn't seem willing to try. When I think of the trouble I'd with her that dear, for like that I'd burst and cry. And it's A1 and he's amazing, amazing and she'll remain. As long as I live I'll never forget the day we lost the train. So away we went to the public house, and when we got to the door, she says we'll go to the parlour end, cos I've never been in there before. So away we went and took our seats in the floor, I rang the bell, I asked her what you was going to have, she says the same as herself. So I carved two gills of the best bit of beer, and she paid for them when they come in. But after she'd swallowed three parts of her gill, she said, Bob, man, I'd rather have gin. So I carved her a glass of the best Holland gin, she gobbled it up the first try. I says one and is as good as a man, she said, Bob, man, I felt very dry. So I carved for another that went the same way, I says, that'll settle thee first. She says, I've had two and I'm need better new than I was when I swallowed me first. And it's A1 and he's a miser, and the miser she'll remain. As long as I live, I'll never forget the day we lost the train. She sat and she drank till she got tagged. She says, Bob, man, I feel very queer. Where I says, dude's had nine glasses of gin to my three gills of beer. She lost her hat and then I shall and tossed them on the floor. I thought she was gonna get rang in her mind, so I sat myself close to the door. She says, give us order, I'll sing you a song. I sat and I glowered at her. I thought she was joking, but I'd never heard one and sing any afore. She gave us a touch of the row in the gutter. She pleased everyone that was there. There was nobody in but one nanny in me and I laughed when my belly was sore. She tried to stand up to sing the cat pie. She fell doing me such a clatter. She smashed four chairs and the landlord come in. Says, what the hell's the matter? He says to me, is this your wife and where do ye belong? I says, it is and she's trying to fit and she's trying to sing a bit sang. He flung his arms around her waist and he hurled her on the floor. And Nan puts out like a dirty whose cat was tumbled outside of the door. There she lay lying both moon and cry at the clamour I really felt shame. I tried to lift her, but I couldn't shift her. I wished I had nanny at Yem. The paperman said he would give her a ride if I lifted her into the trap. But she wouldn't sit up and she wouldn't lie down, so I fastened her down with a strap. 
Still she wants the duck, she wants lies doing. She kicked till she broke the conveyance. She lost a new basket, her hat and her shawl. That woman's still losing the train. And this day one and it's a mazer, and a mazer she remains. As long as I live, I'll never forget the day we're lost.